This video will give you key insight into adding common sense to artificial intelligence. It describes the most important aspects of the way your brain arranges knowledge with huge implications for how we can implement similar structures in computers. Most of what I'm going to describe has been included in the Brain Simulator 3 software which will be open source from the Future AI Society. In this video, I'll describe how common sense works and why it is hugely important. Adding common sense to artificial intelligence is the focus of the Future AI Society, and you can join for free at the link in the video description. Also, at the website, you can watch recordings of recent online conversations which demonstrate many of the topics in this video. Of course, please subscribe like, share, and be sure to leave a comment about what you found most interesting and what you'd like to see next. This is the second video in this series. Rather than sending you off to review, let me give you the highlights. Wouldn't it be great if AI had common sense? Or any of our other programs for that matter? But our AIs suffer from the fields working on the hardest intelligence problems first. While common sense is about simple things, and I'm convinced that our machines won't be able to exhibit adult-level common sense without first addressing the common sense of a young child. This means that we need to think about simple problems. Consider object persistence, three-dimensionality, the passage of time, and cause and effect, things any child knows. To answer this type of question, the information in your brain must be arranged in a graph, a collection of nodes connected by edges. This has been simulated in our Brain Simulator 2 Neuron Simulator to demonstrate that these nodes and edges cannot correspond to individual neurons and synapses, but must correspond to neuron clusters of about a hundred neurons each, and that edges require neurons as well. This limits the thinking part of your brain to a maximum of 160 million nodes. How can your brain do all that it does with a graph which could fit on a powerful desktop computer? In this video, I'll show you some capabilities which would be impossible in machine learning and others which go beyond the scope of today's knowledge graphs as well. So get ready, it will blow your mind to learn the simplicity of this approach and the mental power it gives you. Consider the following. Does Fido have fur? Yes. Why? Because Fido is a dog. How could a graph be structured to answer these types of questions? As I said, graphs are made up of nodes and relationships, and for simplicity, I'm going to start with just two relationship types, is a and has a. But your graph could have as many as you like, as I'll show later. Let's start with an empty graph and add two relationships. Fido is a dog and Fido has fur. Relationships are shown with arrows in the diagram because it is important to their meaning. Fido is a dog, but a dog is not necessarily Fido. This does not mean that we cannot look at the relationship in either direction, just that its meaning changes when we change direction. Fido is a dog also means that dog is a group which includes Fido. Well, Fido has fur also means that fur is an attribute of Fido. Most relationships have a different meaning if they are considered in the reverse direction. With this graph, we can already answer questions like, what are the attributes of Fido? Fido has fur. And what is Fido? Fido is a dog. We can easily extend our thinking to any number of attributes, but the diagram of the graph will quickly become unwieldy 
and meaningless. So when I am asking about fur, keep in mind that I could be asking about hundreds of various attributes. This is typical knowledge graph thinking, but if we think in terms of neuron terminology, we fire the node of Fido and follow any synaptic relationships to see what other nodes fire. If we ask what is something, we'll be following is a type relationship. And when we are looking for the attributes of something, we'll be following has a type relationships. But now, let's add the knowledge that Rover is a dog. Now, if we ask, does Rover have fur? The answer is that we don't know. Bear in mind that we humans always bring our common sense to the table because our mental graphs are already populated with lots of useful knowledge. But based only on the information in the graph at this point, whether or not Rover has fur is completely indeterminate. So let's initially add the relationship that Rover has fur and another that Rover has a tail. The first obvious improvement we can make to the graph is to reuse the existing fur and tail nodes instead of the new ones we added in the previous step. This represents a huge reduction in the number of nodes we need because without this change, we'd need additional fur and tail nodes for every attribute of every dog we know about. But here is an even bigger deal. Focusing on just the fur, instead of knowing that Fido has fur and Rover has fur, let's say instead that dogs have fur. Now when we ask, does Fido have fur? There is an important and necessary mental processing step needed. Instead of returning just the attributes of Fido, we'll follow up the is a relationship and fire the attributes of the dog node as well. In this way, Fido can inherit the attributes of dog because Fido is a dog. When you move relationships around in the graph like this, no data moves. In code, the target of a relationship changes. That is, the value of a single pointer in RAM is changed. This is obviously a trivial issue. In your brain, it's a bit more complicated because we're changing the weights of synapses, but it's still doable and still fast. The whole concept of attribute inheritance is an immensely powerful knowledge compression mechanism. We get a huge advantage from this simple example. First, we don't just know that Fido has fur, but we also know that Rover has fur, even though that information has never explicitly been given. And this advantage continues to pay dividends, keeping in mind that the dog node may have many attributes. Think about it. If I tell you that Max is a dog, you can immediately form a mental image of Max with a significant number of attributes. You may later learn that your mental image of Max has some incorrect attributes, and I'll cover that in a moment. Going the other way, if you learn that all dogs have tails, you immediately know that Fido, Rover, and Max all have tails. Here we have the appearance of deduction. Consider this famous example. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. Yet we haven't intended to create an algorithm for deduction. We're just examining the contents of a simple graph in a special way. The graph and its functionality don't know anything about deduction. It's just following some nodes and edges. The power of this simple feature cannot be overstated. You get a huge improvement in knowledge and a huge reduction in the amount of memory and processing power needed to make your brain work, or an AI with common sense. And deduction comes along for free. But why stop at just one level? Suppose we say that dogs are animals, and animals have mobility. 
if we handle inheritance up the chain of is a relationships, we immediately know that Fido has mobility too. When you consider extending this idea to lots of knowledge, you'll observe a few things. First, the number of is a relationships you can follow up a chain is quite short, that is, for a computer. One could say that the tree of knowledge is not very tall, but is very broad. Although you can construct a scientific taxonomy with perhaps 20 or 30 levels of inheritance, when thinking in terms of common sense, you'll be thinking of fewer than 10 levels of is relationships. I've presented this as a tree structure for knowledge, but there is an important deviation. With this statement, Mary is a girl, you immediately know that Mary has all the attributes of being a girl. But you could also say Mary is a student. Girl brings to Mary one set of heritable attributes, while student adds another set. We can also add that Bob is a student but not a girl, while Susie is a girl but not a student. This only implies what attributes they will inherit, which is equivalent to what preconceptions common sense would apply to them in the absence of additional information. It can be assumed that both girl and student at some point inherit from human the human being node. This is not allowed in a tree, but necessary in common sense. Let me reiterate, the power of attribute inheritance is huge. It allows your mind to handle an enormous amount of knowledge and access it quickly, essentially creating a remarkable knowledge compression system. The neurons and synapses in your brain run nearer to the speed of 1940s telephone relays than today's transistors. Without some type of similar inheritance graph structure, your brain would be too slow to be useful and quickly run out of memory. Before I let you go, there are a few issues with inheritance which you've no doubt noticed. And I'll go over these in greater detail, but I wanted to introduce them here to give you a chance to think about them in greater depth and comment prior to me sharing my implementation. Let's start with exceptions. Not all dogs have tails. Does this mean that we can't put in a dog has a tail relationship, which implies that all dogs have tails? Not a problem. Let's start with a graph showing that Max, Fido, and Rover are all dogs, and dogs have fur and tails. Now we learn that Stumpy is a dog. Then we learn that Stumpy has no tail. We'll add a relationship to Stumpy, indicating that Stumpy has no tail. Then, as we process the graph to get all of Stumpy's attributes, the has-no-tail relationship of Stumpy will override the has-a-tail attribute of dog so that we can learn that Stumpy has fur but no tail, even though he is a dog. The key is that when searching for attributes, if we encounter an attribute that is in conflict with any attribute we've already encountered, we don't include it. While this is simple in concept, Determining that two relationships are in conflict turns out to be trickier than it appears at first. If the idea of a graph with inheritance is huge, a graph with inheritance which handles exceptions is ginormous. What it means is that your mind seldom needs to store the attributes of anything. It only stores the attributes which differentiate one thing from another. When we know a person, you only need to know what makes that person unique. Your mind fills in all the other attributes via inheritance. I cannot overemphasize the powerful implications of this type of data structure. Next, numerics. 
When we say that a dog has two eyes, the two is not an attribute of the eyes. It's an attribute of how many the dog has. So let's address this problem by adding a suite of has a relationship types with numeric attributes. Has two, has three, has four, etc. We'll continue to use has a to mean has one, and we can invent has no to mean doesn't have any, and we'll invent has some to represent an indeterminate number greater than zero. You can immediately see that has relationships interact with exceptions. A generic dog has four legs, but Tripper is a dog and Tripper has three legs. The exception process will take care of everything. In subsequent videos, I'll show an even cooler way of representing this. On to filtering. Another issue with the graph, as I have described it, is that if you ask for the attributes of Fido in a fully populated graph, you'll be inundated with unwanted attributes like Fido is a cellular organism, so Fido has some mitochondria and Fido has some DNA. While these statements represent true attributes, they are seldom useful in a common sense sort of way. So we need some sort of mechanism for filtering the results. It's pretty easy if you've been asked a yes-no question like, does Fido have DNA? But a more generic, tell me about Fido, requires a bit more thought, so that we can focus on results which are meaningful or important for a given context. This is the last concept I want to bring up, but could be even more important than inheritance with exceptions. I call it attribute bubbling. If you know that Fido has a tail and Rover has a tail, can you automatically infer that a dog has a tail and then remove the relationships from tail to Fido and Rover? Perhaps this is what is going on when you are dreaming. Your mind is more or less randomly triggering things you already know, looking for attributes to bubble. In this video, I've reviewed the fundamental graph structure of common sense and added the concept of attribute inheritance. You can see that this is a giant step on the way to common sense, especially when you consider adding exceptions, numerics, filtering, and attribute bubbling, which I'll explore in future videos. I'll show you features to make it even more unique and powerful. I see this approach as fundamental to the addition of common sense to AI, which is why I've founded the Future AI Society. I hope you'll follow the link and join me on this adventure. Of course, likes, subscribes, and comments are always appreciated. I look forward to interacting with you directly through the Society, and of course, thanks for watching.